Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Transport and Place Scrutiny Panel uh, for the 3rd of October. Um, during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphone, and please ensure that you turn your microphone on when you are speaking, and remember to turn it off when you are finished. All reports published as part of the agenda will be considered as read by members of the panel. Oh, yeah. Um, published reports will therefore be summarised to allow the panel to focus on questions. Uh, so, firstly, apologies for absence. We have Councillor Matt Hartley. And um, apologies for lateness. We've got Councillor Sam Littlewood, Councillor Denise Scott MacDonald, and Councillor Callum Burn Mulligan. There seems to be a bus situation going on. A bit of a bus going on. Um, no urgent businesses. Um, any declarations of interest? No. Um, so item four, minutes. Members are requested to confirm as an accurate rec record the minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of July, 2024. Happy? Agreed. Agreed? Great, okay. Uh, so item five is the flood risk and water management update. Um, and we have Ryan Nibs and Ashish Patel with us. Thank you very much for joining us. And I think what we said we might do is you're going to give a bit, a bit of an overview summary and then we'll kind of move on to questions kind of after that. Um, but yeah, take it away. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Nibs, Assistant Director of Transport. Um, my colleague Ashish Patel will be um, covering the points that I've not managed to uh, land and answer any questions that anybody has on the panel. So um, the report advises on the current status and future work program of the council in relation to flood risk and water management. Uh, we've additionally tried to provide an overview of the statutory responsibilities that we have as a borough um, and as a flood risk management authority um, and the role of partners such as Environment Agency in terms of water, in terms of what they have in um, involvement in flood risk reduction. Um, as a council and transport service, of course, flood risk has been a stable part of what we do as a service. Um, but I must add, over the last couple of years, um, we've been through quite a considerable change, uh, change of personnel, new policy updates. Um, and we're now at a point where we're reorganising the service uh, and enabling us to build some more capacity. Um, and we are now in more of a position to provide an operational focus um, and a review of our policies in hand. For me, flood risk is certainly an emerging area more than it ever has been, uh, and, and an intensified focus um, is needed. There are some funding opportunities out there, and with the added resource and refreshed policies, it puts us in a really good position in terms of expanding the service. In regards to flood risks and climate change, there are two main factors um, that us as a borough and all residents have in hand in terms of the roles we hold as a council. With climate change, we have mitigation and adaption. In terms of mitigation, active travel uh, in line with our carbon neutral plan, our Greenwich plan and transport strategies, uh, providing renewable energy, low carbon transport, waste reduction and having efficient buildings adds to the impact that we have on climate change. But then in terms of the role that we have more so is adaption, adapting the way we plan for emergencies, what we introduce onto the network in terms of developments and sustainable um, drainage, biodiversity, enabling flood protection, upgrade of infrastructure, and making sure our, our buildings are designed appropriately. In 2020, we received around 80 planning applications where we had to have flood risk input comments. We're now up to 220 annually. In the borough, there are various sources of flood risk. We have tidal, coastal, fluvial, highway flooding, sewer network, and reservoir risks. Greenwich also faces some unique challenges in this space in comparison to some other local authorities with the Thames Barrier, the Thames Mead area, and with Greenwich having the longest river frontage in London. As the Greenwich lead local authority, we undertake a statutory consultee role providing technical advice on surface water drainage to local planning authorities, major developments, investigate significant flooding incidents, maintain a register of all flood assets, prepare and maintain a flood risk strategy in the areas coordinating views and activity with other local bodies. And we carry out works to manage flo local flood risks in areas um, and issuing consents and altering and removing and replacing certain structures on the highway. In regards to surface water issues, there are 12 critical drainage areas in this borough. 
with over 6,000 properties at risk. With urban creep, extensions, paving uh, under overwhelming drainage systems, sewers in historic designed Victorian standards, we are at risk. In regards to fluvial risk and categorisation, main river catchment, the river Ravensbourne, the river Quaggy, Wickham Valley, the Shuttle, Fal Falconwood Cray catchment area. Well Hall, Jackwood, Little Quaggy, Kidbrook, Lower C Kidbrook, with around 36 kilometres of ordinary water courses identified. In regards to our surface water management plan, it isn't a statutory right, for us to have one in place, but we are moving on to work on that now in order to assess the risk for surface water flooding, identifying options to manage risk to an acceptable level and ensure that we make the right investment decisions. At the moment, the council undertakes its um, surface water management with an in-house service of routine maintenance schedules on all of our assets. We have surveyed all of our drainage assets and we're in the process of benchmarking all of those to introduce technical um, data technology into how we operate the service to ensure a more uh, efficient, um, less responsive way of dealing with that. We want to shift from more of a reactive to a proactive clean to ensure better management of the network, allowing resources to be focused where most effective, both improving customer perception and to give a clear prioritization within a risk-based approach. And in turn, this will reduce the amount of emergency call-outs and customer inquiries we receive. In regards to our local flood risk management strategy, an internal review of the flood risk strategy was completed in 2022. An action plan was updated which suits the changes in legislation and resources. And an external review of the strategy was commissioned in 2023, providing a gap analysis and identifying the changes that are needed within our strategy. The scope has been produced for the new strategy and we'll be looking to commission this and deliver in January 2025, which we hope to come back and update you on. In regards to our asset register, we have an asset register. It meets requirements. But in regards to a, a, a recent data sharing exercise with Thames Water, we're hoping that, that um, extra information will enhance that and that will continue to be a work in progress. I will allow um, to take questions soon, but one of the recent changes in terms of the Flood Water Management Act was the introduction to Schedule 3, which uh, put more onerous and task on us as a borough in regards to sustainable drainage activity through planning applications and the like. I think it's clear that there, there is, you know, some funding opportunities out there for us. Um, we've, we've got, with the Department of Education, we've, we've been working with them to review schools that are in flood zone, which again is something that we'd like to share with you at some point. Um, there's some funding available to assist with flood risk. We've been successful part of the natural flood management program in receiving a million pound um, to progress some work on the Oxley's Wood site, Cloth Workers Wood and Bostel Wood in terms of enhancement of um, biodiversity and reducing flood risk in that area. So like I said, it's, it's an area that with our policies and, and the upcoming funding opportunities that we're really going to start um, emerging on. I hope that's given a decent overview for you to start on, and I'm sure you've got questions that we can try and answer. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the um, really detailed report. I think two things that sort of struck me were, one, of the amount of things you are pursuing in this area, and two, the sort of like leadership role we almost have in this borough, just by virtue of our geography, really, of how, and our vulnerabilities. Um, I'll open it up to the panel for if, if anyone got questions. David. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, report. Um, the, the ward I represent, Peninsula, actually on some maps is marked as a flood risk, but obviously it's protected by the Thames barrier. Uh, but most of it is very uh, lie-lowing, together with parts of East Greenwich um, and parts of Charlton Village and Riverside and parts of Woolwich Dockyard. And I just wondered, um, to be consistent, what the level of flood risk is in those areas to the west of the Thames Barrier. We know it's obviously, and, and, and the flood risk is also in the areas east, which is mainly uh, Thamesmead, um, but also a bit of the Woolwich Arsenal, um, where obviously a lot of development is, uh, is, 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 is planned to happen. Um, and how confident we are uh, in terms of um, 
av avoiding uh, any major floods from the Thames, uh, either east of the Thames Barrier or west of the Thames Barrier. That was my, I've got other questions, but that's my first opener. Thank you. So, yeah, there's a couple of aspects to that. One is through the planning role. Um, we work closely with the environment agency as well. So who are the statutory consortee for main river risk? So um, you're probably aware they will check the heights of the flood, flood walls around there. Um, then our role as lead local flood authority will actually check the drainage that will go in through the river walls. Uh, we make sure that's at greenfield runoff rates as well. So if there is an event that it's not over, it's not breached, but we have heavy rain that we've got water building at the back, we're encouraging new developments to store that extra water within the parcels of the site. The other aspect is that links into the Thames Estuary 2100 plan as well. Um, so we've been working quite closely with their team, at, but there's more work needed to be done in that area. We, we as a council really need to get on board with, with them as well. Um, so they've in, they're introducing more workshops as well that can be attended. So I'll make sure they're circulated around to everyone and members as well to attend. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I know the Environment Agency. I've been to meet them uh, down at the Thames Barrier a while ago. Um, but I'm a bit um, concerned. Maybe they're, you know, short of capacity. But a bit concerned that, that they retain these huge car parks down the, by the Thames Barrier, all this tarmac, which a lot hardly ever used. Uh, all their people seem to drive rather than get public transport. I'm not sure they're... Um, <laughs> Pre, you know, I, I don't sure they they don't follow their own advice, <laughs> and I wondered what discussions we'd had with the uh, environment agency, so they can be better, more environmentally conscious citizens themselves, and we can green that area, which is just huge car parks um, down by the down by the Thames Barrier, and, and ensure they uh, use public transport and so forth. But I also wondered. In, in broader terms, um, and I, I see their comments on individual applications, which are normally quite risk averse, but in broader terms, um, what that relationship with the Environment Agency is like, um, and, and how we do work in, in partnership with them. And just to, to follow on from the point about around the Thames Barrier and those massive tar bits of tarmac around the Thames Barrier, which are totally unnecessary. Um, because they were built for when it was a major tourist destination, which it isn't now, uh, and most people go use active, sustainable travel anyway. Um, I wondered, um, in general, over the borough, what proportion of our land is um, soakable? So it's, um, you know, soft landscaping, grass and so forth. And, and given the development pressures, um, how we're going to sustain that and how well we're going to, you know, can we enhance it at all? So highways is a very good example. A few years ago, we took out the green strip at the center of the A206 down there in Woolwich and put in concrete or pebbles or something and, and horrible barriers and things like that. Uh, but there's so much opportunity to reduce the width of roads and, in, and increase the amount of soft landscaping and so forth along roads. I mean, I could go on about trees, but we're not here to discuss trees. We're discussing flooding. So I wondered if we looked at those opportunities to you know, those often marginal opportunities, but opportunities to increase green spaces, particularly in areas of deficiency, uh, and uh, where, you know, clearly that has an impact on the water table and uh, flooding from the heavier rainstorms we're going to get with climate change. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, we're doing a SUDS opportunity map as well, so we're trying to identify opportunities around the borough where we can um, reduce the grey, basically, and increase the green. Um, but that's essentially what we should be doing as a borough in terms of being on the front foot of flooding. 
is to look for opportunities where we can remove the tarmac, remove the grey. Sorry, in terms of our partnership with the EA, it's really strong. Uh, we meet virtually with them once a month, and we have quarterly meetings with them through the Regional Flood and Coastal Committee and the South East London Flood Risk Management Partnership. So that's attended by us, um, Lewisham, Bromley, Bexley, and the Environment Agency in terms of water. Um, I can take up the um, discussion about the car parks with them um, directly. Um, but I'd say it probably doesn't impact or affect our relationship, but um, it's definitely a discussion to be had yet. Thank you. Great, I think I'll word. Um, Aidan next, and we'll come back to him, sir. We could do workplace uh, parking charges, and that might change it. Anyway, um, what impact, um, what, f how, what are you doing to feed into the development of the new local plan in terms of... Uh, any sort of SPDs or any uh, involvement in how, how that's being shaped? So, yeah, we're waiting for the site allocations to come back, then we're going to be developing the SFRA, um, so that will be linked in with the local plan. Um, and the... Other thing that we often get that impacts people is um, transport routes when we have heavy rain, and a lot of it is pooling water at crossings. So I wondered whether there's any plans to look at some of those roads where we get frequent complaints with that and see if there's any sort of engineering solutions. Actually, a lot of them are in David's ward, the ones I come across. But but I wonder. Um, I mean, I know. This panel is doing a local uh, thing about the Thames Path, but not not to preempt it, but on the the road crossings as well. Um, if we get flooding, um, so we're trying to bring in Carbon Tech, which will be a software that we can give to our operational team. So, our oper so imagine. Um, our ops team having an app on their phone and every time they clean a gully they can record that and once we go around once they'll have siltation levels once we go that around several times they'll start to know which gullies are filling up more quicker which ones they can leave which ones they should come back to that should help and we have been recently trying to speed up any remedial works as well um, that need more engineering solutions, like if the pipe has become blocked and we've tried to jet it and it doesn't work, or it could be that historically the gully is just in the wrong location as well. Um, the challenge is um, at what point do we drop in a gully and fix it and when should we do suds? Because, yeah, it's we could introduce suds, but then we've got to go... Um, identify the funding um, and commission that. Uh, so there is a trade-off between engineered solutions and SUDs as well, because we eat into the budget pots to each other. Councillor Dallas. I'm sorry if this isn't appropriate, but I feel I have to take the opportunity to ask. It feels anecdotally like there is a lot more burst water mains. Is that what you're finding? And what is the responsibility of Thames Water to get the roads back to the state they were in before? Because there seems to be flooding a lot in certain areas and the roads never quite get back to the way they were. So um, if it's a burst water main, we can request that funding back from them because through a burst water main they've got full responsibility of all assets that have been damaged sorry i just wanted to come in here yeah, i mean 
I am aware that typically some of our at-risk areas are around the Castlewood Reservoir, Well Hall, I know we've had some instances in Footscray Road as well, which will all feed in. And the closer you get to the reservoir, the bigger the risk. Um, and we've had some water shortages in there. Um, we met with Thames Water last year and they tried to provide us with some reassurance about infrastructure upgrades. And I think it'd probably be useful. We've got some slides itself that we've prepared not for today, because there's 55 of them, but to share and maybe get some more reassurance from Thames Water as well. They have full responsibility of making sure that everything's reinstated back up to the standard that it was, or even better, because obviously if it's an old surface, um, in some cases, as part of the New Roads and Street Works Act, they have six months where an interim um, material could be used until a permanent replacement has been, has been made. So in some cases, they have that um, in place and it may look as though it's degrading um, but that's what the legislation says but if there's any particular locations that you're aware of we can look into um, no it has been particularly Footscray Road that okay. is it's not my ward but it's next door yeah. um, and has caused quite a lot of trouble although I think the road's back to normal now but has been quite persistent yeah thank you just going to jump in there I just recall we had been dealing with, is it Roots for Life Centre? So we have identified a developer actually capped off one of the drains there. So we're trying to get the developer to uncap it. So hopefully that should help a lot in terms of resolving those issues. Thank you. Councillor Littlewood. Thank you. So, um, first of all, apologies for missing the first half of the presentation, but actually what you've just said leads quite nicely onto this question. Um, we've talked a lot about public bodies here and, and Thames Water. Um, presumably, to implement lots of these flood plans, you need the cooperation of local businesses, local people, and so on. Um, I know you can, there are enforcement actions, there's you know, um, information requests and so on. But are, are, you, are you getting that cooperation that you need, um, and, and could it be any better? So, yeah, in terms of the local flood risk management strategy, we aim to do a full consultation. So we'll aim to bring on the businesses and residents there. We did do Section 19s recently as well um, around Plumstead Road, um, White, White Hart Avenue, uh, King's Ground as well. And we actually posted letters through uh, doors as well. Um, fortunately, we didn't get as high turnout as we wanted, so we got two residents uh, email us back. But yeah, we we are getting people on board, and we are working with friends of Oxley's as well, and friends of Boston as well. Um, yeah, I might ask some questions, and I'll come back around again. Um, thank you very uh, much. A few questions. One sort of about kind of your funding. Um, you mentioned sort of the various grants you're applying for. How much sort of, in a rough kind of percentage-wise, how much are you reliant on sourcing outside funding to do the projects you want to do as opposed to kind of council funding? Um, that's the first question, and then I'll come back. Yeah, we'll take your joint. So... Um, majority, we're reliant on outside funding. Um, we do have some historic capital reserves as well that we're using to match fund, but we're essentially relying on 100% outside funding. Yeah, I just wanted to come in terms of the flood risk, definitely all external. Um, but in, uh, in regards to the assets, um, the operational assets and drainage, that is... Um, on us, that's a revenue budget. Um, we were successful in a growth bid last year um, in preparation for the um, upcoming schedule three um, changes, would, which would put um, more onus on us in terms of planning application perspective as well. So we're in preparation for that. Um, but once we've done our full asset review and we've got that surface water management plan, <clears throat> it puts us in a better position to understand uh, and have a business case in terms of what future investment is needed in, in, in the drainage assets. Um, but again, we're hoping that that cyclical, improved cyclical maintenance may reduce the risk to us as well. Great, thank you. Um, sort of a second question. Um, so I think the, the report sort of talks a lot about the Thames barrier needing to be replaced in sort of 2100. 
Um, but I think if we look at that Thames Estuary uh, 2100 plan, where they were sort of revised, which I think they reviewed last year, they're bringing forward dates of like when the deadlines are to review these things. So if we, if that assumption is wrong and it needs to be replaced before 2100, what kind of implications do you think that has for us as a borough, or what do we do? Is that change what we need to be doing now in terms of? Um, yeah. Thank you. So I think our role in that should be more on influencing and working um, closely with the environment agency. So that probably almost itself takes additional resource compared to a Lon another London borough that doesn't have the Thames going right across it. Um, we yeah we need to be at the forefront working with the EA to make that plan ours essentially so we want to be so involved in it that the plan is around us rather than around what the EA wants um, do you want to ask David I did give you a warning of this um, question <laughs> the um, th this is when I was on the council between 2002 and 2006 this was a big issue then and something I raised and uh, Constantly, and other members did as well, and it continues to be an issue, uh, maybe slightly less of an issue, but a lot of the damage has been done, which is the uh, concreting over of people's front gardens. I think back gardens is also an issue, but it's more visible with front gardens, and clearly we have planning and um, highways uh, enforcement possibilities there. And, and, and about, it's estimated over London about a third of front gardens have been lost to hard standings. Uh, which is an, an awful large area, I forget how much, in terms of uh, drainage area and soft landscaping uh, that could be used for soak away. Um, and as you know, uh, the Environment Agency has very clear guidance on uh, the permitted development of putting in hard standings in terms it shouldn't be more than 60% of the area of the front garden. There should be so many meters, you said 4.8 meters, and there should be porous materials, and it should be, uh, there should be a clear soak away area as well. But many uh, don't um, perform to that. Now, I know that we have improved our uh, level of vigilance in terms of um, when we accept crossovers. We don't encourage them in the way that we used to. Um, but, but the level of enforcement against crossover hard standings cross uh, that don't meet those um standards which are many um and um and 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 and, and people that don't bother about crossovers as just drive over the curb of the pavement the level of enforcement seems to be virtually non-existent so i wonder in terms of the local plan coming and so forth um but in terms of highways enforcement against people parking on uh, their front gardens when there's no crossover or very often because they have much larger cars these days they don't meet the 4.8 meters and their cars come over onto the pavement what what steps are being taken to try and redress that balance um, to ensure we at least can try to stop the attrition of our um, soft landscaped heart gardens which has issues not just for flooding but biodiversity and so forth and climate change uh, but also actually reverse it. And have we discussed this also with housing colleagues in terms of the housing stock that the council owns? Um, I think coming at it from, from two sides, in terms of the area that you're looking at, um, we're also looking at the management and maintenance of curbside space in, in, within our curbside management plan, trying to discourage the change of use of front gardens. We know that the future demand for curbside space, especially in areas where there's, you know, um, sort of uh, dense population in regards to electric vehicle infrastructure as well is going to be really key. So in combination with our curbside management plan, and we have tightened up our crossover policy in terms of vehicles seem to have got bigger over the years. Um, we've seen a downturn in, in the amount of crossovers we're receiving. And if we know about a crossover application, we then can make sure that it's the right material that's being used and a vehicle crossover doesn't get installed until the hard standing is inspected and it meets those requirements. Like you say, the more difficult areas where people may change the material within their garden or illegally use it. We're governed by the Highways Act in 1980. 
Um, I think the fine in that at the moment is around £15 for contravening the footway. Um, and there's quite little enforcement powers that we do have, although you know, in most cases we try to deal with the residents directly, um, post letters, and we use the highways inspection team to do that. I think it's an area that probably definitely needs a bit of uh, reinforcement, um, and it could be something, an action that I take away to see how both of those plans correlate, liaise with our housing colleagues, and probably to refresh some of um, the offices that we've got in the highways team in terms of maybe doing a purge on and looking at that. Um, it's certainly been a problem for a very long time, um, but I think maybe a bit of a refresher on that could get some feedback for you and I could write you at some point. Thank you. Um, Councillor Scott MacDonald. Um, hi, thank you. Um, you may not have the answer yet on this, so I'm fine if you don't have it today. So um, on page 26, and it's talking about the risk management authorities, and it's just more clarification, um, talking about the Thames Regional Flood and Coastal Committee. And I used to, when I was cabinet member for transport, I used to sit on that and represent the, this part of the um, London. Um, which member from the area is sitting on that committee and who attends? That just says we, and then the paragraph below that talks about the local one, and I just wondered if members, does, does any member of any of the authorities attend that one too? Yeah, so Councillor Avril Leku attends um, both the partnership groups. So the Regional Flood and Coastal Committee, then we're all, a tiny bit of our catchments in the southern as well, so that's represented by Bexley. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, Kels Garden. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I asked before about what proportion of our borough is soft landscaped, uh, but just to take that more broadly, it'd be useful to know. It may be that Vicky knows um, what proportion is soft landscaped. Um, and clearly that's quite generous compared to many boroughs, which is a good thing. Um, but also what targets, in terms of our flood strategy, what targets do we have? Um, what what are, are they in terms of, you know, in terms of clean drains, in terms of flood relief and so forth um, in terms of response to emergencies. Do we have benchmark, do we have standards and targets um, that we um, aspire to and measure ourselves against? And that those presumably shared targets with the Environment Agency? Yeah, so our targets are around uh, protecting properties. So... Um, we work closely to submit bids for funding that where we've identified an area that they're at risk from a one in a hundred year event. If we can bring that risk down to a one in 20 or, yeah, or fully protect them, then we'll, we'll do that. That's where we aim to um, work with the EA to reduce the risk. Um, there's also... We assess SUDS applications as well, and we negotiate with developers and try get them in that greenfield runoff rate. So that's improving the current situation. But that's not actually setting an overall strategic target. So I wonder what targets, if any, we have and how they're measured. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to come across, obviously, we're reviewing our um, flood risk strategy. We do have actions in there, not to hand now, but I think, you know, similar way that we've got the transport strategy and all of the framework action plans, what's been useful for us is to set out clear objectives and actions for us to be able to track and trace. Um, so, I haven't got them to hand, but there are some in the existing one, but of course, it is up for refresh, so... Great, yeah, councillor Scott Mulder. Uh, so, um, in term, it might be a question for you, chair, rather than the panel. So, in terms of this document, can it be changed, or 
or, or suggestions or is this the final sign off? What's the process, I suppose? I think we can make recommendations or, I don't know, really? We can make recommendations or, do you want to edit something in the document? No, 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 I just, I mean, I don't know if it's gone, if it's gone live already, so I just wanted to know. So I just think it should be, uh, I know you say, they, it says, I know this is so minute, but I think when members are involved with, um, some of these bodies, I, it would be helpful if, if the report could say that the member, there's a member that participates as well as an officer or something like that. But nothing, but if it's not, if it's gone public already, then forget it. I mean, but yeah. We could maybe add an addendum with that. Raymond, I don't know. Well, for the next time you do the report, yeah. Yeah. I think, I forgot a fair point, fair point. Um, I think I might finish off with two questions, if anyone else has got any. Um, so just my final two questions. One was um, about, going back to that 2100, those recommendations about what, where we should be um, in 2100, and the idea that the embankments and flood defences along the whole Thames are supposed to be raised by, I think, a metre. Um, and the, we're seeing all the development currently happening along the river now. I'm sort of interested in how you're kind of feeding into, in, A, you're feeding into that, how you're going about trying to influence that happening in terms of obviously rep um, replying to planning applications and things like that, but also whose responsibility it will be further down the line, you know, 10, 20 years time to make sure that those are happening. And if they're not happening, is that our responsibility as well as a council? So that's one question about that meter um, increase. And the second question, final question, um, is I'm glad to see you're working on the Riverside strategy, um, which I think is part of all the joint Thames strategy, and just interested in how we feed into a framework as a council. So those are my two questions, the final questions. So in terms around the river walls, um, the ultimate responsibility s sits with the Environment Agency as responsible for the River Thames but we've got a role as the planning authority when we get those applications in and we're reviewing comments from the, uh, from the environment agency. And we've also got additional duties under the national planning policy framework where we've got a duty to make sure flood risk doesn't increase elsewhere. And throughout the lifetime of the development, it remains safe from flooding. So from that, that aspect, when we do, um, when we do re request the river walls to be heightened, we need to be uh, mindful of the heights that are required, basically. And we, we are doing that, basically. Um, and the EA plays a key role in that. Um, in moving on to your second question, um, We've started feeding in with the riverside strategies as well. So um, through the Thames um, RFCC, um, approximately, I think it was 1.2 million um, that's been uh, made available. Um, just trying to think if it's UCL that are involved with the strategy as well, because there's a group of authorities in London that need a riverside strategy, so we're inputting into that strategy as a collective. I can probably provide more details after the meeting as well. Thanks very much. Um, I don't know if anyone, and I've, I've noted a few recommendations or down, but um, I don't know if anyone wanted to add anything. I think I was just gonna suggest, um, one would be great to, uh, if you could circulate the workshops you mentioned earlier, um, two was uh, if, yeah, if we could follow up um, Ryan with the environment agency about the car parks uh, on the Thames barrier um, and targets for landscaping and also to note who sits on panels and also um, I was going to recommend that we bring flood risk back yearly to this panel because it should actually be coming more regularly than it is so as an item that it comes back more on a more regular basis I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Hello, thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to item uh, six, which is an update on the local plan, planning enforcement, and uh, planning services performance. Um, what I've suggested is for the officers to give like a very top lines of the uh, report, and then we go into questions. But we'll try and group them in terms of like local plan questions first, then planning enforcement questions, and then planning services questions. So we keep it a bit focused. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Richards Cottle. Um, hi, Victoria Gagan, Assistant Director of Planning and Building Control. Uh, Michael Clarkson, Planning Policy Manager. Thanks. So, by way of introduction, um, this report considers three areas of planning. The local plan update, an update on planning enforcement, and an update on development management performance. And before I summarise the three areas, I thought it would be useful to pull out a general overview um, of what planning is and what it does, because then they sit in the context of all that. So planning is about the big things. It's about the sustainable development and balancing the economic, environmental and social impacts of new development and delivering positive growth for existing and future generations. And that's what planning does, amongst other areas of the council, of course. Um, the planning system is a key contributor to making this happen. And it's, set, it's setting a long-term vision for the place and managing and balancing these competing interests and delivering real change on the ground through the developments that come forward. It's not just about, planning's not just about dealing with planning applications, it's about that long-term vision that we capture in the borough's plan, um, and then the decisions that are made on the applications through this decision-making framework. So the local plan is a really important document for the borough to make sure it gets what it wants to get. And as planning manages the right to develop land, there's often a conflict between what a developer wants to do, so the private interests, and what their local community, the public interest, would like to see happen in the borough. And these, these different interests need to be balanced through the planning system, and that's one of our you know, big challenges of how we balance that and where we put that weight when we deal with applications. So planning is a, a positive deliverer for placemaking and regeneration and good growth. It's not just about stopping poor quality and destructive development from happening. It's about being proactive and it's about delivering a local plan for the whole community. And it's about focusing and working to encourage investment in the kind of development that will be more likely to deliver the vision that you, your communities and neighbourhoods wish to see in the borough. So I'll briefly touch on the few issue, the, a few issues of each of the three areas under scrutiny tonight. So firstly, looking at the local plan, obviously this is a very exciting time for us. Um, we're bringing forward a local plan and all that brings and all the discussions we'll have about the, the area around what we include in the local plan. So it provides an opportunity to set out what we want to see in the next version of that local plan. So it's really important that everybody's engaged, not just the people who work in the council and the councillors, but the local community, so we can try to reflect what is coming from the local community. So we're currently in our evidence gathering phase, and that will inform our choices on how we develop our policies. And we've recently finished um, a call for sites, which will also help establish our five-year housing land supply, which is a must for any local plan to make it through examination in public. So I can't stress how important that element is. And then just turning to planning enforcement, you know, this is a small team that deals with harmful breaches in the borough, and the most obvious one that we've dealt with lately is the mass key and the public inquiry and all that entailed. We're currently undertaking some process improvements that will enable us to act more efficiently within our limited resources. Um, and this has, if you look in the report, this at the moment has resulted in more notices being served at the end of last year than we've served in previous other years. So we're trying to focus our limited resources and focus on our efforts. And then lastly, just on the planning performance piece, um, the report sets down um, performance against the government measures and, and how we're performing. So we're performing well against the government measures, but we do use extensions of time for non-major applications, and we do use planning performance agreements for major applications. And we often use these sometimes to deal with the capacity issue, um, but also where we accept amendments to a scheme and for our major applications, where it sets a more realistic time frame than the 13 weeks that's set down by government. Um, DM is a busy service and there's never any let up in the applications that we receive. So I hope that just gives you a very brief summary of the report and all our issues. Thank you. 
Brilliant. Uh, so we should open up for questions. We sort of maybe stick to the questions about the local plan first. If anyone wants to come in, Councillor Gardner. Well, thank you. I was um, fortunate enough to be on a small group convened by um, the then cabinet member <laughs> um, on uh, different aspects of the local plan, which you were both uh, within the meetings, and that was very constructive. Um, I don't know whether that now has come to an end or whether we'll be uh, reconvened at some stage, what the new cabinet member uh, has in mind. Um, but um, but the, the, the process does seem to have slowed down. And I'm very conscious that um, the last time it, it happened, it was a, a tighter timetable back in 2013-14. Um, and, um, you know, things could be overtaken by events and so forth. Um, so uh, it would be useful to know more about the timetable and to what extent members will be in, involved uh, further in the process. That initial involvement was uh, very helpful. Um, and I'm very keen that the local plan is very clear in terms of the overarching strategic objectives as well. Uh, so maybe you might uh, comment on that. Another aspect of the local plan, Chair, um, is, is that I raised actually at the last planning board, is that some, uh, in, in, in our ward, Denise and my ward, but I'm sure in other wards, we have an issue about overseas speculators buying investment properties. In fact, Night Dragon advertise it as such sometimes, if you look at their boards. Um, and uh, properties, many properties being empty or just used as Airbnb or short-term lets and so forth are not at all meeting the housing need that we have uh, in the borough. Now, some London boroughs like Islington and Camden, I think, have quite good policies and come to arrangements and put down conditions. But I was told um, when I raised this at the last planning board on a particular application uh, that we, we couldn't do that. So we're at the mercy of each developer because we don't have a policy basis uh, to do it. Is that something that we've looked at in terms of the current local plan so we can ensure that um, the, the houses that, that are being developed or flats being developed, they're not just um, the large, we don't lose a large proportion just to uh, over, you know, short term lets and overseas investors and so forth. Uh, thank you. Um, firstly, in terms of the process of the local plan and the workers' members group, um, clearly I'll have to speak to the new cabinet lead, but that did work very effectively, I think, and I think it would be something that we would like to carry on because it was a good forum for um, discussing um, and getting some views of members. And I think at the moment we're having a pause from the working group as we go through the evidence gathering. And I think um, Michael and I can have a discussion about when it would be appropriate, when we have the pieces of evidence back, to run through those with the working group again. So you get a flavour of what's coming out in terms of the employment land review, the local housing market assessment, our open space study, and all the other bits of evidence that we're going to. So, so we can do that. Um, in terms of um, overseas speculation, in terms of buying to let or buying to leave, as Islington called their SPD. Um, I worked in Islington that when that SPD was brought forward. Um, we don't have any policy at the moment for that, and it's something we can look at in terms of our local plan. We would need to have evidence that there is a problem with people buying flats to leave rather than buying flats to rent, um, but that's something that we can explore as part of the local plan. In terms of Airbnb and the rental market for tourists, um, London has this unique position where people are allowed to do that for a 90-day period every year. As you can imagine, that's an enforcement nightmare to understand how long somebody has rented out their property for an Airbnb. Um, so it is really difficult to say to somebody, well, we know you've tipped over the 90 days. Um, so it is difficult within London to enforce that. Um, but I think in terms of the buy to leave issue, we can look at that as part of the local plan policy. I think I covered everything, Councillor Gardner. Any other questions on the lo kind of local plan? Eric, yeah. Ben Mulligan. Cheers. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for joining late. Thank you very much. Um, 
Victoria, for your presentation. Um, I guess just two quick questions. One is, um, to what extent, in terms of the local plan, have we sort of taken a beat to consider implications of new legislation coming forward, given we've got a new government in place? Um, and uh, then secondly, what would you put sort of as the rough time scale for where things are and where you would hope we can get the new plan all signed, sealed, delivered and in place? So, yes, we have, I mean, there's been the recent consultation on the changes to the MPPF and also some general changes to planning reform. So we've obviously, as a council, we've made a response to that consultation. Um, one of the two, well, two big obvious things that came out of that was the standard methodology and how you decide what your housing need is. And the second one would be the issue around the green belt or the grey belt as it's now been termed and about looking at that as part of your overall local plan review. So um, just on those two particular, I mean, we are taking into account any new uh, legislation or the idea potentially of what will come out of there. We're assuming that most of the changes in the MPPF will be brought forward by the new government. So we are looking at those. Um, as part of our local plan work, we are doing a review of our metropolitan open land. So we don't have any green belt, but we have the next equivalent, which is metropolitan open land, and whether that is serving the purpose it should be serving, um, against against what it what you know about stopping coalescence and ensuring there is openness in your borough. Um, so we are looking at that to see if every everywhere that is designated as MOL land still fulfills that purpose as part of the local plan. And then in terms of <clears throat> housing delivery or housing need, and um, we're uh, at the moment we're going through a local housing market assessment. Um, and when we have the results back from that, which we're expecting back in autumn, um, and we've digested them, we can you know, share those with, with members. Um, I think under the standard methodology, our need went down, but where, because we're part of London, the, the London plan also has a target and that's enshrined in the London plan. So we're working to that target, which is 2,826 units per year um, in terms of delivery. Obviously, we're not responsible for delivery. So that's a deeply flawed policy that the government have, um, but hopefully that might change one day. Um, but obviously, we also monitor permissions to make sure we're giving enough permissions. And we also monitor as part of the local plan, we have to demonstrate that we have a five-year housing land supply. So we've got enough land. It's not just land that's available. It's the where where that land is in terms of, is it in pre-app? Does it have planning permission? Is it implemented? And when are those units likely to come forward to fulfill that five-year housing land supply? Thank you. Councillor Scott MacDonald. Um, thanks. Um, I have a question about your issues and options consultation that took place last year. Um, and I don't know if you, I mean, I'm new to this committee, so maybe you've already done some feedback in reference to it. And it says here there's 303 responses. Is there any way you can give us a flavour of um, what people mostly commented on, whether it was, whether it was uh, design and heritage, climate change, transport, what was the main themes? I know you've, there were five themes, I think, big themes, but what were most people talking about? And any idea where they lived, if you can? Um, you may not now, I just wanna know if they're all from SE10. <laughs> uh, from memory, um, I believe the, the strongest topics that people gave responses on were around housing and climate change. Um, and I think design and heritage got the lowest number of responses. Um, I can get the figures um, after the meeting and share. Um, in terms of where people were commenting from, I think most of them um, were done via the commonplace platform. So that is anonymized. So we don't, we know if they are local residents, but we don't know whereabouts in the borough they're from. But we also got um, responses from um, the development industry, statutory bodies, uh, and other, 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 um, a couple from um, neighbouring boroughs as well. Um, so there's quite a mix of, of respondents. It's good to see there's a local plan members working group. Um, I'm not on it, but I mean, it's good to see it. <laughs> Uh, 
can I just come back in? I think, um, Councillor O'Byrne Mulligan, you mentioned about when we'd have a draft local plan, so I forgot to answer that one. I think we're aiming for mid next year for a draft. Is that correct? Yeah, ish. Um, obviously, we need to agree with the Cabinet member the timetable, and then we have to publish a revised local development scheme. Um, to solidify that that time scale but yes um, hopefully by mid next year we'll have a draft plan to consult on great um, um i've got two uh, smaller questions um one um what is the soundness consultation i'm just interested what that is um the second question is um just about when you're when you publish it um Will this be two versions, or how, how is it going to work for both like planning professionals and maybe like everyday people who are doing like housing extensions or something like that? Um, and yeah, that's it. So the issue of soundness um, is laid out in the national planning policy framework. So there are four tests of soundness that the plan will be examined against when it's um, submitted to the planning inspectorate. So independent inspector will review all the policies in the plan and review everyone's comments from the consultation and um, he or she will decide whether the plan is sound as well as legally compliant. Um, so I believe <laughs> it's testing me in terms of my memory of the tests of soundness, but um, the plan has to be positively prepared so that means we can't write policies in, negative w in a negative way that suggests <coughs> we want to stop things happening, so they have to be written positively. Um, it has to be justified, so based on evidence, which is why we're doing this evidence gathering process. Uh, policies need to be effective, um, so they should be able to be implemented and delivered. Um, and finally, they need to be in conformity with the national planning policy framework. And we also have the additional test in London of being in conformity with the London plan. Um, and the second question, yeah, I think uh, we will work with our community engagement team and communications team to, to consider what options we have in terms of um, the consultation materials, because yeah, pl the plan can be dense and technical, so we need to work out if we can explain that in a bit more in, in layman's terms, so to speak, um, so, so it can engage kind of um, people who aren't that into planning yeah and i think the way the plan's structured it will be strategic high level policies that will look at those sort of big topics like housing climate change and then you'll have your area based policies which feeds in from the site allocations and then you'll have your local and technical policies so i think for sort of householders it'd be more the local and technical policies but it, they sit within that wider framework of everything we have to consider Sorry, just going back to soundness. The reason we have to have a consultation is we have to ask those questions of, of consultees if the plan is sound. So people may object to particular policies and say it doesn't meet one of the tests, and then the inspector's job is to analyze whether that's the case or not, and whether the council's made a reasonable case that its policies are sound. So that's uh, laid down in the regulations that we have to have a consultation specifically directed at those questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, should we open up to any questions about planning enforcement? If anyone wanted to come in on planning enforcement here, yeah, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the figures uh, that you give for, you say that performance dipped from 2020 to 21 22. Um, but what, I, I couldn't really work out what they would have been before. So is that, is that, that the, it, sorry, this is appeals. Sorry, I'm asking about appeals, uh, not planning enforcement. So. So, say that, anyone want to, Councillor Little, Littlewood? Thank you. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of types of enforcement that a council can take for you know, all, all manner of reasons. And they're, they're rightly done on a case-by-case -case basis. But if I look at you know, master key enforcement, for example, so um, you know, phase two, so, the developer there is well going through a process at the moment uh, for, for um, planning reasons. But just next door, there's Mars Key Phase 2, which has a fire enforcement um, against it for cladding. And there's another building in Woolwich Town Centre that also has um, cladding problems and a fire enforcement order uh, owned by the same developer. So you can draw in conclusions about the behaviour of that developer. 
but can enforcement teams work together to try and get a better or quicker outcome? Can they change that behaviour by working together? Um, so I'm not sure whether it would change the behaviour of some people, but we do work together. So we use our planning enforcement powers when that's the most expedient way to work. Otherwise, the council has collected all of its enforcement powers together in this integrated enforcement umbrella. So they, that meets regularly and it discusses cases. And, and I, as I understand it is when there's a case, it, there will be a discussion about who has the most effective enforcement power. So if it's fly tipping, then it would fall under um, a different, different service to say planning enforcement. For us to deal with fly tipping, we would have to go through a much more long-winded procedure than just being able to find somebody, for example. So we do, we do, we do collect our powers together and use them. Um, who's, got the, who's got the most effective powers to deal with whatever the issue is? And integrated enforcement meets, I think it meets once a week, and then there are branches of it that look at specific um, topics. Thank you. Um, so one simple and possibly stupid question, uh, just so I want to just make sure I've understood it correctly. The number of people in the enforcement team, is it seven posts but six people in place or six posts but five people in place? Because I just wasn't quite sure from how it was worded uh, in the report. I'll go through. There's a manager, a deputy manager, three inspection officers, and then half a post that looks at um, HMOs and licenses and unlawful conversions. So five and a half people. And there's one vacancy, there's one vacancy in that post, team. which I think okay. has just gone back out to recruitment today. So we, we recruited, we did a recruitment and nobody applied that we could shortlist or that we could, sorry, that we could offer a post to. So we've gone back out again. Thank you. I mean, that is, particularly when you look at the numbers, that is so much work for such a small team to do. And it, you know, it makes sense why when you, as a Ward Councillor raised particularly smaller enforcement issues why it can feel like it takes quite a long time, um, particularly when we've got some of these big major ones that I imagine will further eat into the time and capacity of the team. Um, I mean, to what extent would you say that having a very large, complex and high profile case like Mask Key will have inhibited the ability of the team to pick up some of these other things and then second question is you know if money were not an object um, how many people do you think actually we would need to to do the kind of enforcement and proactive enforcement you know it's something that comes up in planning all the time is we impose conditions um, often to assuage concerns of neighbors and so on um, but you know uh, do we have a, is it a paper tiger <laughs> I think when you get a very large um, public inquiry like we had on mass keys or, or for example, there was another one earlier on in the year um, on, a, on a premises in Greenwich, they do take up a lot of time when they end up in public inquiries and there is, there is no way to avoid that. I think it, 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 that's the process but it is time consuming and it does take away officers who might have been otherwise dealing with other cases to deal with that because when you've got a public inquiry, you're on a time frame that we can't change. So we have to devote our, our, our staff, our capacity to that. Um, I can't remember what the second question is. Oh, I know, that's it. How, how many officers would I like? I actually can't answer that. <laughs> I would have to think about it. I think, you know, when you, when you have a small team and we're going through a process at the moment where we're looking at how we work, um, and we're looking at where best to prioritise things. So with planning enforcement, just because somebody breaches our, reg our planning regulations doesn't mean that they are, it's an automatic, it ends up automatically going to um, some form of enforcement. So we have to look at what that breach is. Is it, is it a technical breach? Um, and does that breach cause any harm to anybody? 
or would that breach be something that as a planning department if it came in as an application would be acceptable to and if the answers to that is yes whilst there is a technical breach there is no harm arising from that breach then we wouldn't ever think it was expedient to enforce and on those cases we need to be very clear to people and then we need to shut those cases down but explain why we're shutting those cases down and if and and invite the person who's 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 undertaken the breach to try to re regularize it through a planning application and to do it that way and then you can focus your the finite capacity that we have on the mo the most harmful breaches and and those that are causing the most harm and actually you know in reality we do rely on the community to tell us when there is a breach because we don't have the amount of staff to go around and be proactive and look at the borough but it, it works quite effectively because people will tell us when something's going wrong uh, thank you chair um, without trying to go into any particular cases um, clearly we get a lot of planning enforcement issues in in our ward um, and I remember back in 2004 we doubled the size of planning enforcement team from three to six so I wondered what the substantive team is now I also wondered um, one thing that came to my attention obviously is, is some councils like Hackney use the proceeds of crime act in order to get more money in uh, I, I can see it's good that we we did get some money back in one particular case um, but uh, but I, I wondered what the um, avenues might be available in order to uh, retrieve some of the money that's spent on on the team uh, who clearly are hard-pressed um, I also got a specific question um, and how many notices have we issued under section 215 of the town and country planning act in the last year and how many of those were appealed to the magistrates court and how does our numbers of notices being issued benchmark against other London boroughs so there's five and a half in the team five and a half posts in the team one is vacant out to recruitment now um, in terms of the proceed of crime act it's that's not the reason why we take take enforcement action um, that to go through and get proceeds of crime you have to have served an enforcement notice that enforcement notice is then appealed that enforcement notice is dismissed so the enforcement notice is live and the person shouldn't be doing what they're doing if they carry on doing what they're doing we then have to go and go through the courts and prosecute them and as part of that prosecution then you can apply the proceeds of crime act so it's not straight it's not straightforward but Obviously, if we ever get to that stage, we will always consider whether there is the proceeds of crime acts that can be applied. So, so we do consider that. And I, I think um, there was one case back in 2016-17 that I think was um, effective on those grounds. Um, I'm just trying to think, what else was your other question on? The last uh, question, how David? many section 215? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I don't have that to hand. I, so I know in terms of some of the, the authorities that serve a significant number of enforcement notices, we are quite low. Um, but actually last year we did increase our number of notices. Um, in the year 20, in 23, 24, we served 146. And this year to date we've served 50. So the year before 23 24 we served a lot less so it has been increasing over time and that's because we're applying this um, slightly different way of of dealing with enforcement so if something is harmful we move more quickly to enforcement action and therefore it sets out a very clear message what the person needs to do to overcome that and if they don't then they need to go through the appeal system and go through that way um, but we are increasing the number we've served. As to the Section 215s, I'll, I'll need to find out that information for you. Okay. Um, I to, uh, just had two questions myself on the planning enforcement. Um, one was um, how we're making sure sort of staff are um, sort of supported or protected if they're kind of maybe going into slightly hostile situations um, with enforcement. Uh, second is, um, I think, certainly I can speak for my own ward, you sort of see a lot of issues that come out 
um, with new developments when they're sort of passing over from developers to managing agents or to residents um, in terms of things that haven't been completed on the development or things that are coming up through service charges. And is this a way that we as a council can kind of make sure that's kind of smoother so those, those things are being done in the first place and they're not coming up later for enforcement or is that not really a role for us, do you think? And the, sorry, the final extra question was um, when taking planning enforcement action and just making sure we're like following through, um, could you be, speak a bit more about, about how we're sort of like completing it so we just residents have like reassurance that things have been done and completed? Yeah, so on the, on the first question, um, how do we protect staff when they go out? So we have a loan policy um, a loan worker policy and staff are familiar familiar with that and indeed inputted into it when we when we came up with the policy so we so we make sure that we have like a buddy system so if somebody goes on site and they're not happy when they're on site they have to they're advised to leave if they're going on site and it's isolated and they don't feel comfortable or we know of somebody who might not necessarily be calm on site then we will go in pairs um, and so we have we have measures in place and people shouldn't finish on site at the end of the day without informing the manager so we know that they've clocked off for the day that they're safe so we have a number of, of ways in place to protect staff um, when they're on site doing the enforcement action in terms of um, enforcement action so when we take enforcement action and serve an enforcement notice um, that enforcement notice mm -hmm. has a time frame that they have to comply with the notice. So we would diarise that and we would go and check. And if they haven't complied, then we can consider prosecution and then we can carry on taking it through that direction. Or if they've complied, we would make sure that the people who originally complained are made aware that it's all complied and it's shut down mm -hmm. and, and that's the end of the matter. In terms of the middle question, I wasn't quite sure what you meant, if you could explain that a bit more. Oh, no, sorry. Um, just in it sort of feels like when you've got like, those newer developments, which are maybe like 15, 20 years old or something, and they're, or they're being passed over from a developer to the managing agents or to the residents who are taking over as directors, and it feels, certainly I can just speak about from my own ward, it seems that's when you sort of see these sort of slightly like planning enforcement cases coming up of things that were not originally done by the developer which have now come to light or things have come to light through the service charges. And is there more of a role, do you think, for the council? Do we have any sort of like maybe, yeah, a role to play in like making sure that's done, those things are done beforehand while they're still with the developer or is that kind of more of a national? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult one because when we've got a small team, it's difficult to go out and do development inspections on big schemes. So generally speaking, we don't go and inspect when a scheme is finished. We rely on the fact that the, the developer has done everything that they should have done. When we're dealing with the discharge of conditions, that's when we will, obviously if it's a big scheme, we're working with the, a profession, the professional team that are building out the development that's when we rely on and point out to say, well, you've, you've, you've discharged all these conditions that set that one, so you still need to do that one. So there is a way to pick it up that way. It's not foolproof, and because we don't do development inspections, we do rely on the fact that developers do build what they should be building. Um, as you can see from previous cases, that's not always the case. Um, in terms of when they're transferred, so if a developer sells on the site, um, it goes through a legal process, so if somebody's buying that site and that development, they should make sure that their, you know, their legal and their conveyancing are checking to make sure it's, it is, they've discharged everything they should have done and, and built out a, a, a permission that is, complies with those plans. So there is, is self-checking going on. Like clearly, if somebody buys a site where it's not all above board, then they're buying a site potentially with those problems that might come up and we might enforce. No, that's great, that's useful, thank you very much. Um, okay, final round. Uh, for, um, any questions on um, the planning service performance? I think, do you wanna finish your question, Councillor Smith? Yeah. Planning appeals, yeah. So, um, so it says that performance dipped um, 
before that. So you've given us figures from 2021 up to 23, 24, and you suggest that performance dipped in the earlier two years, but I'm not sure what the figures would have been, say, for 19, 20, and before that. So it, are you saying that it's no, more normally kind of 64 percentish, and it was a bit lower then? Yeah, so I think you're looking at, sorry, some of the bullet points, not paragraph numbers, because I was having a nightmare with the paragraph numbers on this report. So it's the, t it's the appeal table, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, in tw yeah, there was a dip in 2021-22. Uh, we we tend to say that if we end the year with a 60-40 success rate, we've done well. And the reason why it's not 100% is because sometimes we don't want to make timid decisions. Sometimes we want to push issues and see how the planning inspectorate, um, you know, think of an issue. And, and sometimes the decision doesn't always go our way. So there is a bit of that in terms of sometimes why, why cases dip. In terms of those particular years, without having the data in front of me of which ones we lost, it's difficult to say particularly. But what I can say as a general overview is, we look at all our appeal decisions, and we look at whether, if we, if they obviously if they're dismissed, it goes that's going our way, so we're happy. If they're allowed, we look at why they're allowed, and if we get a series of uh, appeal decisions that might be allowed on the same particular issue, then we will review how we're doing something and potentially change the way we do it. So an, an example, recent example would have been on a certificate, which is somebody saying, I want to build this rear extension and it's permitted development. We refused it and the planning inspectorate came in and said, no, actually, that is permitted development and allowed it. So we've learned, so we take a lesson away from that and next time we deal with a similar situation, we would, we would be allowing it in those situations because we've misinterpreted the permitted development regulations. So, but we do look at all the lessons that we can learn so, and, and, and adapt where we think it's pertinent to adapt. You also say that there was 128 planning appeals in 23-24, um, but do you know what the figures were for the other years, so whether that's, that's sort of more than usual or...? Roughly, it's it, depending on the year, but it's, it is around the 100 mark. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but it is around the 100 mark normally, so as a standard, give or take. Sorry, and the very last one. Um, I'm often having to explain to residents that planning enforcement is usually a cost rather than something that we can always get the, the money back um, because often we, even if we win the appeal, if I think if it was not deemed to be an unreasonable appeal, we have to pay the cost of fighting that. And, it, and I'm thinking of one in Charlton Riverside a few years ago that cost us, I think, a six-figure sum. <laughs> um, but but in terms of how how are we doing in terms of getting costs awarded so um yeah i think the way the system works is people appeal but you only go for an a cost award if if either party has behaved unreasonably and that's the key test we've got to be able to demonstrate that either we, the council, have behaved unreasonably, or the appellant has. Um, and so, generally speaking, we don't go for costs, and neither do the applicants when they come back to us. But occasionally, we do, we do go for costs, and the applicants occasionally go for costs. So, I'm just, I'm trying to. I'd probably have to get the data as to how successful we've been at costs, and, and vice versa. We don't get many costs awards either way, um, because obviously it can be quite expensive when you do. Um, on the most recent uh, public inquiry we did, we did put in a cost claim for that because we thought that the other party had behaved unreasonably because they kept introducing new material and updating plans, etc. So when we think there has been unreasonable behaviour, we will decide to go for costs.
Any other questions? Yeah. Councillor Gardner. Thanks. I wanted to um, just focus on two aspects, really. The length of time, um, obviously, we're very familiar with the 13-week and 8-week thresholds, but it always strikes me that applications take a lot longer than that, and yet the performance looks very good. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a, a, bit, a bit of a dichotomy there. Um, I know that some of the big ones, we have these planning performance agreements, but that's just a few, really, in terms of the percentage of the overall application. So I wonder what can explain uh, the fact that we have a good performance, so we're meeting the majority of applications are being processed within the 13 weeks or eight weeks, but um, it doesn't, the applications we see, very few of them have been processed within that time. So there's a dichotomy there, and, and I just wondered if you could unravel that, and um, you know whether we can, and that we have lost one or two cases due to non-determination, sadly, um, and I, I wonder if there are further steps that we can take uh, to um, avoid that in the future. Yes, yeah, so in terms of the majors, um, on most of our majors in Greenwich, we get very large majors and very complex majors, and 13 weeks is just, if we, were dealing, if we had to deal with them in 13 weeks, we'd have to refuse most of them, um, because they're not at a point at that stage that we can support them. So for example, if, if, uh, if we have to look at the affordable housing percentage, so if it doesn't come in as a policy compliance scheme, and we have to do a viability appraisal, that often can take time because then there's two in and throw in between each party as to our conclusions and the applicant's conclusions. So, so majors do take time and that's why um, it says 100%, that's 100% with planning performance agreements. Um, and that's because we, you know, they're important applications that we want to um, negotiate to make sure we can get to a point where we can support the scheme and bring forward a development in the borough. So we do work with applicants and applicants are happy to work in that way. Um, I think going down a system of a really strict time frame that would lead to an appeal system and lead to more appeals and more costs just wouldn't be favourable for any of us, I think, and we'd probably end up in far more public inquiries, and they are very costly. So that's on the majors. On the non-majors, I would say, th from my recollection, roughly a third rely on extensions of time. And there, being honest, some of that is because we've had capacity problems where we've lost staff and we haven't been able to get them back quick enough and then we've got all these applications that don't stop coming into the department. So, so we have relied on some um, extensions of time to deal with that issue. We have brought the BRAT log significantly down for non-majors, so now I think we're, there are roughly 60, 70 cases that are over eight weeks that we're still dealing with. Um, in terms of um, committee cases, they tend to be all over the eight-week period just because of the running time to get a case to committee. So if you sit on a local committee or planning board, then it's likely that those cases are over the eight-week period. But as we're working together with those applicants, they tend to agree extensions of time and hence some of the figures you might think are higher. Having said that, not all, all of our applications go over eight weeks, Councillor Gardner. So we, we do try, and, and you know, offices have been working tremendously hard over the last year. Um, as as Councillor Smith will know from his, you know, cabinet one-to-ones, to bring down that backlog, to make sure people get certainty when they put an application in, get certainty within that eight weeks. If we think that something can be amended, we have allowed them to go over eight weeks and then dealt with them by an extension of time. So what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to wean ourselves off the use of extensions of time, in particular because six months ago the government um, had a consultation on whether they would get rid of extensions of time. I don't know what the new government will think and how they expect that to play out, but we'll wait to see what happens. So we're trying to wean ourselves off, be more efficient and deal with them more efficiently. That in itself can annoy people because when they get the decision at eight weeks, 
if it's a refusal, they'll go, well, why didn't you let me revise it? Well, well, we're trying to be efficient. If we let you revise it, we're just creating more backlog. We do in some cases, but not in all. Just um, follow on with a question about capacity, which obviously has been a London-wide issue. Um, and I wondered to what extent you feel that we've turned the corner and to what extent we're working with the professional bodies uh, like um, the TCPA and so forth uh, and universities um, that train people um, on apprenticeships and uh, retention schemes and sponsorships for qualifications and so forth um, and obviously with, with other boroughs in the same uh, situation. And also, perhaps, comment on that, but also comment on another feature, obviously, is, um, is, is, is that, like, you know, like my sister, who's qualified, that, that people go into the private sector because they pay more, um, and, and whether we're paying the right rate, and whether we paid more, we would therefore be more effective um, and have to spend less on interims and short-term uh, employments and so forth. So we have just been out to recruitment for the non-majors team, so the East and West team, um, and actually we were successful, so we offered four posts to four planning officers, so we're just waiting for start dates for them. So there is a capacity problem, not just in Greenwich, but across the country, and so it is difficult to secure uh, good quality planners. Um, I think... The capacity issue is not generally with new graduates, um, and that's what we've just been out and recruited now. There tends to be, it's that sort of missing middle when people get two, three, four years experience, and then they look at a planning consultant and think, oh, that's more attractive, I might go try, see what that's like, and obviously they do pay more. Um, and I think, you know, people have to make choices about um, whether they where their interests lie, whether they work, want to work for a public sector organisation or a private sector organisation, and, and, and what are the things that make them change jobs, for example, and go elsewhere. I think across London, um, we probably don't fare as well as some other authorities in terms of what we pay our planners, but um, I am going through trying to get some of the JDs evaluated in... in in view of bringing forward um, a reorganisation, um, which is obviously time consuming, trying to um, update all the JDs. But that's something that's in our gift to do subject. And the, you know, the planning fees have gone up recently, so we're in, hopefully, I haven't had it agreed yet, so it's something we're looking at. Also, what we, we have done in the past, and we've got a student now, we have a year out student placement, and we've taken, so a couple of years ago, we took two um, from the University of Newcastle. This year, we've got one from the University of Newcastle. Um, and there are also other measures we can use, such as the pathway to planning, which is a central government thing. So if we didn't have the year out student, we would have probably looked at that. Um, and also there is the public practice where if you need some specialisms, you can apply to see if they've got any that they can give you obviously you have to pay for those <laughs> so we're, we're doing the best we can um, and I've been to a series of meetings run by um, Business London looking at that same issue along with developers about what can be done and that and actually just on that point um, the majors team is uh, almost entirely funded by planning performance <laughs> agreements so without that source of income, it, we wouldn't have as many offices dealing with major applications. Any other questions from the panel? No? Um, I just had uh, one or two la last ones. Um, just with the, um, the backlog on the majors, is that mainly fresh applications or is that also a mix of amendments and um, land that's kind of coming back kind of with new proposals so what's it sort of made up of yeah so on the majors backlog that's mainly made up of submission of details i would probably say entirely made up of submission of details because the actual applications 
are in a timed programme, so they're not counted in that backlog. And part of that is um, getting responses from external bodies, um, but also some of them were historic, so we are going through them all um, in terms of dealing with the older ones. Um, some of them, it's where we're in a, a, an implementation PPA with the developer, so we do let those go over because we're working with them to try and get them so we can approve them. So it's just a different way of working, but it does, does create a, a large backlog, but they are entirely submissions of details. Um, and we are, we are going through them trying to get rid of them. Um, and then the only other, um, other one was just um, in sort of like, I mean, just sort of like small situations where, particularly maybe with minors, where you've got people going to like pre-app consultation and sort of being given one advice and then maybe having a different outcome further down the line. Is there anything we can be doing to sort of, re re sort of reduce that discrepancy between them? Yeah, so if that happens, we will, we will review it. So if, we're, if somebody comes in for a formal pre-app and we're giving them advice, and as long as the application they submit reflects that advice, then they should be getting certainty about the decision they're going to get. Um, sometimes they don't always reflect the advice they've got, so they might put something in slightly different, which means they might get a different decision than they were expecting. Um, but when, it, when that is, you know, because clearly when somebody gets a refusal and they're expecting approval, <coughs> they, will, they will approach us and we will look at that and make sure that we haven't said one thing and then done another thing. So we, we, do, we do review those. Great, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? No? I, I made a few notes, recommendations that people mentioned. Uh, one was a, a policy in the buy to leave kind of to be explored. Um, and section 215s and, but, yeah. of the TCPA. Um, any other recommendations anyone wants to put forward at the moment? You can email them over time. Other than just more money, more resources, more capacity, all of the above. Um, thank you very much, uh, Victoria and Michael. Thank you very much. Yep. Before, uh, be before you go, I just think also we should record, um, it's obviously our job to scrutinize you and, 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 and pick at the edges, but um, we should record that we're very, um, well I am, I'm sure everyone else is very thankful for the huge amount of dedication and work, professional work that you do. Um, I know we don't always absolutely agree, but we recognize you do a very good professional job and we're very, you know, over planning and enforcement and things like mass key and so forth. And uh, we're very, very lucky to have you all. Yeah, definitely. Pass that back to officers. Okay, um, just before we go, um, item of commissioning of future reports. So the next meeting is um, supposed to take place on the 20th of November, um, which is have the transport work program um, update, and we're also gonna have this cabinet member update as well. Um, but anyone want to add anything? We've already sort of briefed both of those. The third party strategic projects with transport, we're, we're gonna try and bring to the annual scrutiny Review, so we're only bringing sort of um, outside parties in once. Um, yeah. I'm just going to ask, because um, I'm very interested in the work on the Thames Path. Obviously, it's got four kilometres of it in my ward. I see there's an upgrade uh, time-limited review coming to the April meeting, which is a long time away, but are we setting up a small group to look at the Thames Path and do some work on it and um, look in depth, or are we... Um, uh, how, how are we going to manage that process? I think you may have missed an email, Councillor Gardner, but there were, it was, it's well underway. Oh. Um, I will talk to you afterwards because okay. it, is, it, is, uh, it is well underway and um, we're doing lots of work on it. All but right. I will, I'll talk to you afterwards. No problem.